Welcome back to the Upper Tier Podcast, the football podcast we bring you each and every week on the Dynamo Podcast Network. Head over to YouTube, smash that subscribe and bell notification button. Audio versions of the show are available through Spotify. And tonight we are continuing our Legends series with the one and only Tony O'Dowd. How are you doing, Tony? I'm great. Thanks very much, Noel. Great to have you on. Thanks for taking the time. Tony, uh, just no to let you around. know, you are the first goalkeeper we've had on the show. So just to let you know, honourable mention there, you know. Um, Very good. Now, Mark, Mark, as we both know, Mark Hogan, my cousin, he's a referee, but he likes to consider himself a goalkeeper as well. But he's our resident referee when he's on the podcast. Um, <laughs> let's start. Talk to me about football. When did football? I know there's a history of football down through the family and your dad was a, a recognised goalkeeper in football as well back in the day for Pats and for Dundalk. Um, talk to me about football and the family growing up. Um, it was it was just always there, you know what I mean. Um, when the back in the day we didn't have any playstations or anything like that, you know. So we had four boys in our family. So you know, my ma's head was wrecked. So it was just kind of get us out in all weathers and just play. And sure, the only thing you had was a ball. You know what I mean. I'm not yeah. saying, I'm not saying, you know, we we had the best of everything as well. But all you wanted to play was football. We didn't know anything else and you just enjoyed it and just kind of took it from there and you were playing out in the streets and like there were, back in the kind of them days there was no academies around so you, you were from six you know they're in academies now from six but you were out on the road from six and you were playing with lads probably 12 13 you know what I mean mm. so it was just just totally different to the way it is now you know what I mean I don't know if it's better or worse like I, I see the academy system now and see some of the players coming through and the facilities they have and it's fantastic you know so like when I was trying when I was trying as a kid say under 12 we probably had probably four or five balls to train with and we had one decent ball and we used to say I would say I used that ball for the match you know yeah. like now now in academies and I know from Shamrock Rovers like um, every kid has his own ball and it's a brand new ball all the time you know what I mean so Certainly, things have come on, but football was always there for me. It just, I never thought about it, you know. You never thought about going train, it was just a natural thing. As we said, my dad always he was always playing and he, he ended up breathing as well. So, um, always doing something with football. Yeah. <laughs> he was the worst ref in the bleeding world. I used to go out and watch him and just, oh god, I used to be fucking embarrassed that some of the decisions he used to make. It was unbelievable. I, I know, I know. Refs get a bad rep, but yeah, he certainly deserved it. It was terrible. <laughs> it's kind of that. There's, there's a kind of a madness that flows through goalkeepers, isn't there? That probably doesn't equate with a good referee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, pro. Um, I do. I, I think the madness is that, like, you, you, you have to, you know, be mentally strong to be a goalkeeper. You know, because you've got big fucking centre halves and any ball. Any time a day make a mistake or a ball comes into the box and they always turn around and blame you. So you have to be able to, from a young age, be able to stand up to that. And you know yourself, you make a mistake as a keeper nine times out of ten, it's in the it's in the back of the net. So when you were going out, you have to be a bit, I don't really give a fuck. Because if you thought about it too much, you went out, say, you know, a league game or semi-final or whatever, and you think, Jesus, if I make one mistake here, we're out of the cup. Or if I make a mistake here, that's three points gone. That could be the league gone. Yeah. You know, so I think it's just a bit, you're just fucking out there and you just, generally I think you just, most keepers just mm. don't really care. You know what I mean? They just yeah. do their own thing and mm. fuck everyone else, you know? They're definitely a different breed. My own young lad plays in the under-19s LFL and he's a goalkeeper as well. And I'm telling you, Tom, he wouldn't step foot outside of goalkeeper. You'd ask him to play out there for short players and he'd sooner get into the car and go home. He's yeah, no. I I start I started out as a centre forward for Cherry Orchard, and um, it was only under twelves. Um, we went out to play Stella Maris, and at that time Stella Maris were by far the best schoolboy club in Ireland. Yeah. So we went out to play them, um, and our keeper didn't turn up, or he went away for a weekend or something like that. And uh, I just got in goal, had a great game, and then after the game, Stella Maris just uh, poached me. Really asked me to. Uh, Approached me dad and asked what I signed. So I, I signed there after one game uh, for probably the best club in, in Ireland after just one game. Never played in goal before. 
and that that's kind of where it all went downhill then you know <laughs> that's a heck of a story isn't it <laughs> yeah it's just... there playing as a center forward <laughs> sub in as a goalkeeper they saw you after a game <laughs> talking about pressure <laughs> yeah that's what i'm saying probably just you know yeah. nothing to lose at that stage just went in enjoyed myself and Obviously had a good game and I know I definitely saved one pen I won the game anyway. I might have saved two, but um I, I wouldn't mind. They still beat us six 0 in that game. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh good. Um let, let's go down through the career. Started out at Shelbourne, as as so many of these boys do. Went over to Leeds and um, back to St. Pat's, 138 appearances for St. Pat's, 96 then for Derry City and 124 for Shamrock Rovers. Then drawed at Malahide and finished up with Shelbourne with 25 appearances. Um, how did the how did the Shelbourne thing come about? Um, <laughs> another bleeding weird one. I have some weird stories. I, I was playing schoolboy. I ended up playing schoolboy with Home Farm. And kind of after 18, you obviously go to the, the League of Orange. They had the League of Orange B team at the stage, so I was going to go to them. But... Um, my brother was at Brighton at that stage, so I kind of threw my brother, they came over and watched, threw my brother and I went over to them on trial for a week. I never told Home Farm. So when I came back um, from Brighton, Home Farm says, oh, I heard you were away in Brighton. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, no bother me. And uh, he said, well, you didn't tell us anything. That's, can't be doing that. You're out of the club. So, out of the club, Grant, what can you do? That's the way it goes. I went down and started playing with a team in Ballyferme called uh, Markovic Celtic through um, Mick O'Brien, the uh, the Bowes and uh, Alone keeper. You know, he used to break the crossbars. Mad Mick, he used to work with me there. So he got me down there. He was managing Markovic Celtic. So uh, he got me down there. Uh, played about half a season with them. Did all right. And then uh, he recommended me to uh, Pat. Pat Bourne, who was manager of Shelbourne at the time. So Pat said, yeah, send him down. We'll have a look. Went down first night. Uh, good start. Great start for me the first night. I was 45 minutes late for training. It's unbelievable. He <laughs> couldn't make it up. So train, and he had a couple of sessions, and then he asked me to sign for the B team. And then I uh, played for the B team and uh, kind of played in all. They had a lot of friendlies against the English teams, like... Uh, Leicester, uh, Millwall, and all at that stage. I played in all of them, and in most of them, I was I did very well. So then, at the end of that season, I was an under twenty one. After playing like literally six months ago for Markovic Celtic, at the end of the season, I was a, an Irish under twenty one. I was in the B squad for Ireland, and there was four or five clubs after me from England. So talk about a, a turnaround about leading six months, you know. So the trip to Brighton to the seaside was well worth it, yeah? It was great. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> Had a couple of great nights out over there. Um, tell us about then the switch to Leeds. How did that come about? Um, that was, was obviously playing the played in a few friendlies, played against Leeds, Leeds in a friendly as well. But I, I think about two weeks before the Leeds game, I had a very good game against Leicester. And then I was on the, the League of Orange Select to play in Arden, Ireland and a few clubs went to me. We we were up playing in um, the Oval in Glentorn against the the, Nash, the the Irish League select, and we beat them one nil. Uh, I think Tony Cousins got the goal or Anthony Harkins, and um, I saved a penalty on that. Had another good game. So after that, I went over to um, went to went to Huddersfield to have a look around, and I went to West Brom, and so I decided I was going to go to West Brom. Uh, Brian Talbot was the manager. Actually, Sam Allardyce was the assistant manager. So I decided to go. I was going to go there. So they'll do not. So Pat was supposed to go. I think it was um, Thursday or something. So Pat was picking me up. Um, we we're traveling over. So he arrived in the taxi anyway. And uh, I said, Grant went out to him, and he just went, uh, Tony. Yeah, he goes. Yeah, there's a bit of a change of plan. I went, oh, geez, what's here now? You know, is this the deal's falling through or something, you know? And he says, you're not actually going to sign for West Brom now. You're signing for Leeds. So, obviously, <laughs> whatever went on the background, you know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously, Shell's got a few more Bob Bale Leeds than West Brom are willing to pay. Mm. But when you're kind of 19, and I would be fairly laid back anyway, 19, I just went, yeah, grand, no problem. 
So I went over and signed for Leeds, Leeds kind of straight away then, you know. Never even saw the place. This was Leeds when they were very much on the up as well. They were a powerhouse. Yeah, just well. just yeah, just got promoted from um say the champion, just won the championship as it is now. Mm-hmm. Uh, came up, signed a good few players, signed John Lukic. Um and then the first year I think I was there, they came came toward in the league and then the second year they won the league. So yeah, they were top at that stage, sort of thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, plus there would have been great links, Irish links with Leeds as well. So ah, yeah, like kind of especially around my generation, there's loads of Leeds fans. You know what I mean? They all, you know, I'm sure that there'll be a few more now, sort of thing. But around my generation, there's loads of Leeds fans, sort of thing. You know. Mm. What What was the difference like over there? Moving, moving to say Leeds. <laughs> um, it's well compared to the the League of Ireland, it's like it's like cutthroat you know what I mean it's you know there's you don't get any there's no well especially at that at that stage there's no arms around the shoulders or you know unlucky it's you do your shit or you're out of there you know what I mean mm. um, but that's just you, you see it you know say at a top league like that you've got all alpha males you know what I mean they're all the best they've probably been the best player always in every team they've been all the way up so they expect to be the best and, you know, they should, everyone's playing for contract. If you, could you imagine if you were a plumber and you had a contract and for two years, and if you didn't produce, say, certain results as a plumber in them two years, you lose your job totally and you have to look for another job. Mm. It's, you know, dog eat dog and everyone's looking after themselves and, and that's just the way it is. But um, there'll be more of a camaraderie at that stage in League of Ireland where... Um, over there, like it was just like players, especially the four same generally didn't li- live in Leeds. They they were could have been traveling, maybe definitely an hour could be two hours. A lot of them lived in Sheffield. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so then you come back to St Pat's, one hundred and thirty eight appearances. Um, so what was your memories of being at St Pat's? Um, generally good. Now you know I didn't leave on the best of the best of terms but um generally good like especially the first year I was there I got a player of the year and you had like Ozo there Trapper Tracy John Ryan and they're just you know just mad just nuts you know what I mean like just total out now characters there was always something going on in the dressing room and it was a great way to learn as a you know a youngster you know what I mean you were just kind of from from start of train to the end of train, it was just um nonstop, just people taking the piss and having a laugh and like they were serious on a match day as well. Um but it was a good good mix of um experience lads there and kind of lads, couple of lads like say David Campbell and myself that came back from England and then you would have had uh Soupy uh, Campbell as well. So and a couple of other young lads, you know. But uh, a great mixture. Just wasn't wasn't kind of that was when just after Pats had won the, the league maybe two years ago and a lot of lads had played well and they'd left then and kind of there wasn't a lot of money around Pats then but um, great times and great experiences you know what I mean and like you know you know t- Tony Itzy was there you know I used to hang around him um, poor lad obviously uh, passed away but like you know you're coming back from Cove one day and he's on the we're all down the back of the bus and he stripped, we stripped him absolutely bollock naked. And you know, the, the old coaches, they kind of had the, the yeah, thing in the, the, the thing. Yeah, yeah. all his clothes went out. It wasn't just take them off and hide them and straight out down the thing. So Brian Kerr, at the end of it, Brian Kerr is coming down, fucking murder going on. We we're all getting off the bus to go and Tony hits his down the back, covering himself. Brian Kerr goes, what's, what's going on? He says, ah. Just the way it is. So he has to get a bleeding tracksuit top and a pair of tracksuit bottoms, walking off. Just mad stuff. And we left. Pat O'Toole used to play for uh, Cove at one stage. He got the bus home with us, you know. Um, he went down whatever and he got the bus home. And we stopped for the, everyone stopped for the piss because we were having the cans and all the way back. Yeah. So we all got back on the bus. Everyone on. Yeah, everyone's on. Boom. Coach goes. Pat's still out having a fucking piss. He said, he said, he said, you know, at the dead of night in, in the country, he said he saw the two lights going down the bus and he said, they're going to stop now any second. 
they just got they got inside. And he said he just saw the lights going around the corner, and he said he couldn't believe it. He had to walk to the next town. And fucking he just left them. Stay the night. Yeah, it just left them. Oh yeah, God. like there was more to that. There was more to that Tuesday night now, and after train, you know, when fucking when Brian Kerr found out, but he didn't even know that night because no one missed him. You know what I mean? <laughs> Because yeah, he, he was only hitching the lift. Yeah, he was yeah. only getting the lift home from Cove. He wasn't on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god! Oh, and like the whole thing was, you know, no one, no one said, "Oh, jeez, we better fucking, yeah. you know, say it." Just breaking the bollocks down. I said, oh, "Fuck him, he's grand. He'd be <laughs> all right." <laughs> yeah, God, that must have been. There must have been some stories there. Say he's never. Oh, say he must have slept with a no eye open. They just went just around tours. Oh, big just, time! Like you know what I mean, especially you know. The, the sub cable was another fucking legend, Brian O'Shea, Milo, you know. And we were, we went up to pre season, we went up to uh, Cairn Don and Donegal, you know, for a weekend away. Gee, it was just a piss up, really. But all the young lads were coming home after the nightclub. The older lads had left after the pub. So we were walking home, you know, and this is the height of the fucking troubles in Donegal. So we were ha- walking home. We had to walk to a guest house. It wasn't even a fucking hotel, it was a guest house. And we were walking down dead of night we see about fucking four people out in the field one has a, a thing up like this where you going another one has a shovel and we're going what the fuck's going on here you know and then they started shouting in northern voice oi, oi, and started pointing and we just legged it but it was only fucking trapper fucking tracy and john ryan and milo pretending out there you know what i mean that they were burying someone we were fucking shitting ourselves. <laughs> fucking, they must have been waiting there. Like, we were gone whenever. They went home early. They must could have been waiting there an hour for us to come up. You know what I mean? That was clearly Mad. planned. That was clearly yeah, planned. That's what I'm saying. But it, they must have been waiting an hour and fucking dead and we just for that fucking... And would they have, would they have the told us straight away when they got back or would they have let it go for a while? Ah oh, no, totally straight away. We were kind of fucking, they were just breaking the bollocks lap and then us fucking legging her up the road. Didn't know what was going on. Oh, and then that God. night, sure, they just, they just burst into all the young lads, literally kicked down the door, buckets of water all over us all. And fucking, we ended up fucking having to barricade ourselves. It was like a fucking Brazilian prison where really. <laughs> had the fucking, the bleeding mattresses up against the door, afraid they were coming in again. Just mad times, you know what I mean? Just great times. <laughs> but, <laughs> brilliant like you know what I mean when you think back like Jesus Christ if you, if you heard about something like that now Jeez, these say, days you just go I'd say when you're seeing him with the shotgun in the field you must have proper crap yourself yeah but you know when it's at night it was only a fucking stick but you know when you've got someone like that and fucking pointing something at you and shouting yeah. you in an hard accent yeah. and someone digging you're kind of going oh, that much was fucking what have I stopped yeah you just kind of uh, hilarious but fucking great at the same time you know oh my god Tell, tell me about the move to Derry then. Yeah, the move, um, the move from Derry kind of came out of nowhere, sort of really. Um, it was kind of having a bit of um, trouble with Pat's kind of, you know, wages were there, wages were there, and he was kind of looking for a new contract, and there were him and Han, and at that stage, you could only, you, it was kind of just around the time of Bosman, and before the Bosman, if they offered you five quid on your, on, on your contract, you had to stay. You couldn't leave. So you were fucking screwed, really. So kind of that's what they were doing from, from me. So I wasn't too happy. Um, and then uh, out of nowhere, um, they said you're going to Dirty. And, and Dirty had just nearly won the league. So um, it was a total shock to me sort of thing, you know what I mean? And then um, and just before I left, I was... I was out a couple of weeks' wages from fucking Dirty, or not from Dirty, from Pats, and they fined me two way, two weeks' wages for fucking something stupid, like, you know, some made up shy. And uh, I just said, right. Just to balance it out. Just to balance it out. And I said, right, I'm not going anywhere. Fuck you. And uh, Dirty ended up paying the two weeks' wages to me, you know. Ah, okay. Um, what was it like up there? That must have been a different culture shock. They were. Um... It was intense, wasn't it, Derry up there? Oh, it was absolutely brilliant. I love my time up there now, but kind of more akin to kind of an English club now than kind of a League of Ireland club because mm. you're going around Derry and it's a real, you know, uh, football city. Like, kind of out in the country, it'd be all kind of gab, but in the town and all, it's um, it's all 
football. Um, and you're, you're now, and it's a bit weird, you're kind of walking around and say, yeah, you're going to know you, and where you come from, Dublin, where you're a League of Ireland player, no one knows you apart from actual League of Ireland kind of fans sort of thing, you know. Mm. Um, but it was brilliant. But yeah, good times. I, I didn't have a great four season up there now, to be honest. Um, I found it a bit, a bit weird and if, you know, I didn't have a great four season. Um, Paul Dillon was up there with me. He was a great help to me, but um, they were that great. I had one fucker behind the goal all the time. You know, in the League of Ireland, and you, you can just hear them. And any time it went quiet, he used to go, oh, David, you're fucking shy. Go back to Dublin. Non-stop, non-stop. Just this one bloke. And I swear to God, it used to... Like, we'd have 10,000 people shouting to me, I couldn't there. But every time it went fucking quiet, this voice, and it was just wrecking my head. And the lads would be saying to you, I said, fuck, I want that gun. I said, to me, oh, we fucking get him. But um, I ended up, had a good time up there and did well the last couple of seasons. I'll say the second season won the league, and then yeah. the year after that, kind of, I got player of the year, even though we were kind of nearly relegated, sort of thing. Mm. How, how was your time with Felix? I feel he's grand, yeah. He was trying to sell me every opportunity he believed and got. <laughs> Apart from that, it was grand. I know Felix is good. He's a good lad. Tried to sell me after the four season. Then I came back and won the league. Yeah. Then he gave me a big contract to stay. Then we nearly got relegated and I got player of the year. He tried to get rid of me again. And then stayed another year. And then Rovers came in. And uh, that's kind of the move I wanted to thing, you know. And... Uh, but uh, Felix mad. He's, he's great. Like, you know, he'd never talk to you about football. It'd be all about um, other stories and kind of life lessons, sort of thing, you know. Yeah, he, but, mentioned, uh, he mentioned that when he was on the podcast. He wouldn't talk much about football. He'd be educating me on life and stuff like that. And all, right? Yeah, he'd come in and say, look, I'm not even going to talk about football because most of his fuckers have no clue what you are doing. <laughs> so and that'd be literally, you think I'm winding me up. That's what he'd say. I'm not talking you. just don't know what you're talking about. Says, I'd, I'd be too uh, tell you he was too educated in football to, to talk to mere mortals like us you know <laughs> I heard um, we had James Keddy a, a friend of all of ours James we had him on there a few months ago and he told me that there was um, some great stories about the road trips up to Derry in the car oh, for fuck's sake we had we had a like that year we won the league with a great crew a Dublin crew we'd, we'd obviously Jamesy and then um Richie Porty and Tommy Dunn. And Tommy Dunn and Richie Porty are like a bleeding double act. You know what I mean? Like funniest bleeding guys ever. So you'd have Jamesy and Richie in the back and I'd be driving all the time and then Tommy would be shotgun. But it's just fucking hilarious. The slagging's going on. You just It's just mad. And like, there was one time, whatever happened in the back, James and fucking Richie started punching the head off each other. Jamesy gets out of the bleeding car and there's fucking all blood down his shorts, you know. We used to have to wear a short and tie to the match. There's just blood all down his plain yeah. shorts. Yeah. James, he was a real wind-up merchant. No doubt. Uh, he, he knew how to probe you all the time to that point, didn't he? Yeah, a yeah. really dry sense of humour, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, yeah. funny, very witty. And yeah. But the two lads were just hilarious, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Really, really funny guys and top men and great players as well. Yeah, I, no, I, always, like, I always found with James, he was very laid back, but always very switched on. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. certainly switched on when it comes to bleeding money anyway. <laughs> Tightest bleeding man alive. <laughs> but um, yeah, great player. And he really should have got away, you know. like He had a fantastic season that year when we won the league. Mm. Um, I couldn't believe he didn't get away to um, a club because he was still... He's still young enough. I think he, he might have been only 23, 24. Um, but that year, we had a couple of like lads, a lot of lads had fantastic seasons. Like, really, you know, Paul Hegarty, you know, Sean Harrig and Pizza Hunting, like, really fantastic seasons they had. Gary Beckett, you know, like, and um, James was one of them. It's very, very surprised he didn't go away, you know, get a move because he was that good. He was, I, I, I've said it to a lot of people, he's probably one of the best League of Ireland players that never went away. And I, I don't know why, really, you know. He, d- he definitely deserved to go away. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us about the move to Rovers. Yeah, the move to Rovers came 
that was kind of out of blue as well, sort of thing, because um, I think they were in the year we won the league. Um, I think they were they were in for me then. I think um, at the end of it, and I think I think Dirty and kind of Felix got a sniff it. So I, I two years on my contract left then, and then Dirty gave me another scrap back, gave me another three year contract. Um. I think they were afraid losing me on the Bosman just straight away. Um, but then the year after, we didn't have a great season. Um, but I, I got player of the year at 30. And um, then Rovers came in. They weren't they were kind of weren't doing great either. And they're, they're kind of struggling for a keeper at that stage. So just came in for me then. And uh, Joe Cole, I was putting a few quid into Rovers at that stage. Um, so... They reached an agreement and went down there. I was delighted to get down, you know. Absolutely. Was Willie still there at that stage, Willie Burke? No. Willie, we, Willie had moved on, had he? He, he, might, he might have moved on to Pats, I think, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I'll just make a check. Um, so let, let's let's talk to me about them, this um, Masters football that leads. <laughs> yeah, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Masters, yeah. Never played a fucking league game for them, but I'm in the Masters team. Um, one of the lads I used to obviously was on the played reserves with Dylan Kerr. Um, he kind of recommended me to you know the Sky Sports, and I was actually going away to I was going away in the Stags, I think, somewhere to uh, fucking uh, Liverpool or something. You're going away in the Stags, and I was in the airport, and uh, you know, like, you know, 20 lads or whatever, and taking the piss, and got a phone call from a number I didn't recognise and uh, it was English accent. Boy, this is whoever Mark fucking thing from Sky Sports. Uh, just wondering, would you be interested in coming over and play? So obviously, I thought fucking lads are taking the piss here. Up, yeah. yeah, fucking. I said, yeah, all right, no problem, good luck. Just hung up straight away. <laughs> so, um, rang me back. He goes, hello, I think we got cut off there. I says, uh, you're, I know you're only taking the piss, to, you know what I mean? I'm not fucking from too long in the game for all that. He goes, no, no, this isn't a wind-up sort of thing, you know? So I wouldn't believe him anyway. He says, look, I'll call you tomorrow. I'll send you an email and I'll get someone from the office to ring you and you can ring the office back. Uh, so I said, look, I'm going away the weekend. Ring me Tuesday or whatever. So still didn't believe it, you know what I mean? But just, so he rang me back on Tuesday and then, so I wouldn't believe it. I rang him back. He gave me an over for Sky and got through to him and just took off from there, sort of thing. So I think it went over three years in a row or something like that. But it was great crack, brilliant crack. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. Really look after you well, like you know what yeah. I mean? Because you know, every all expenses paid and mm. a nice few bob as well. And picked up from the fucking airport and a, a fucking Merc and all, you know. Traded properly. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, I used to remember watching it on Sky. It was a great spectacle as well. And you had some great guys in there playing as well. Some great names used to play and stuff. And they were all proper still ballers and all. You could see they still had their touch and stuff like that and everything, you know. So oh, yeah. Really enjoyable. Like, fantastic them. players. Like, and, you know, like, obviously, you would be run the mill and there'd be a few run the mill players. But, like, there was really some, like, superstars that did play on it. You know what I mean? Like, you, like Roy Kane was playing, like... um. Like I knew Roy from the under twenty ones, the Irish set up and that, but like there was real superstars playing there, do you know what I mean? And it's very enjoyable. And um I think I'm surprised they they didn't keep it going, but uh I think they tried to go kind of nearly global with it. They were kind of going over to Malaysia and all trying to sell it over there and yeah. getting really, really top players playing that sort of thing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um let's move on then. The move back to Shelburne. Um, moved back to Shelbourne from well, I went I went to Drottle after Drottle after Rovers. Uh, another there was more financial trouble at Rovers then. And uh, I think we went, I think I went about eight or ten weeks on page, you know what I mean? Um, what, but it wasn't what, the only what, one. What do you reckon that is, Tony? You can see sometimes in the League of Ireland, there's a bit of a pattern there, isn't there, when clubs they get a bit of success. And then all of a sudden they fall away. 
and they run into financial trouble. Is it just is it just financial mismanagement, or is it too much investment and speculation, or what 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 do you reckon it is? Because we say don't we say a reoccurring time after time with some of these clubs? Yeah, you do, and like uh, to be honest, at, at that stage, Rovers kind of had nothing really. Mm. They were just uh, a name and a set of jerseys. You know what I mean? Because that was kind of in the years where the homeless years where we kind of didn't have a ground. We were going from, say, uh, Martin Stadium, uh, Talca Park, Richmond Park. We even played a home game down in Thorners Cross. Like, you know what I mean? Um, so they were just set of jerseys and like they were just, you know, just didn't have that income because they were spending money on rent and uh, like they were giving contracts to lads that. I don't know where they were taught they were going to get the money, like, you know, and just they had maybe at that stage, maybe four or, time, four or five full time players and just didn't have the money, you know. And then it kind of, uh, they amalgamate with Talatown and Talatown kind of directors took over, and that's when it went to fucking total shit, you know what I mean? Because no offense to them, but they hadn't a clue how to run the League of Ireland club. So they were way out of their fucking depth, you know what I mean? It wasn't like from the Leinster Senior uh, team. This was fucking people wanted their money on time and it wasn't kind of a uh, jolly up where you can stick 60 quid in someone's pair of boots and they're happy enough for it. Like there was lads depending on that money for our fucking mortgages and that, you know what I mean? So they were kind of, they were thrown in the deep end as well. But um, it's just, yeah, as you say, financial mismanagement and people promising players uh, wages that they've no chance of fucking, you know, fulfilling. Nearly gambling on doing well for the first half of the season, so they can pay the wages in the second half. And then, if they're struggling first half, should they have no chance. And and a lot of people didn't give a shit about the players at that stage. And you now they didn't care whether they were paid or not. You know, we've come up with a, a couple of a couple of times with directors, and you're saying, well, you know, where's me feel love? And they're nearly looking at you, going, oh, "Fuck off, would you?" You know what I mean? You'd feel like bleeding deck them, you know? Yeah. Well, absolutely. what can you do? Yeah. You know, it's your money. You were just asking for it. And it's like you're fucking taking it out of their pocket. Mm. Well, probably half the time you are nearly, because they probably have to pay it themselves. But like, that's not your fault that, you know, the club gave you that contract or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, talk to me about the brother Greg as a footballer. Greg, super player. I'm not just saying because he's my brother, um, super player. I tell you, he kind of, he missed, he missed, um, if he was playing now, we'd be playing in England. He'd be playing championship, maybe even premiership. Um, kind of, he'd be perfect as a fucking wing back. Wasn't up and down. Engine, go all day, up and down. Fucking one of the fittest blokes I've ever seen. Um but he went. He 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 went over to uh, he went over to Brighton. He started. He went over to Brighton when he was fucking fourteen. You know what I mean? Uh, mad when you think about it. Um, so he went over there full time, fourteen. Um, went all the time, all the way up till he's about eighteen. Uh, I think he was got a one year pro then. And then he, as he was going to sign, played a couple of games. Played against uh, Middlesbrough when they were decent. And that you know, played a couple of games in the first team when he was young enough. Um, but just as he was, he was about to sign a new contract. Fucking club went bust again. <laughs> Brighton went bust, and they weren't allowed to sign anyone. Anyone out of contract, they got, had to get rid of. So he was really unlucky. But um, as I say, probably if he was playing now, he'd definitely be playing Championship or or, or uh, Premiership because um, wasn't up and down. Not the, not the most physical, and that's what I'm saying. League of Ireland back then was very physical. Um, probably didn't suit, but nowadays he'd, he'd be great baller and you know fit and just perfect for the way people play now with the attacking fullbacks. You know. Yeah, I suppose I have to bring it up, but I'll bring it up anyway. At the height of your success at Derry, of course, tragedy struck with young Connor. Give me, give me a few words on Connor. Um, a total pat's no. He was him and the brother Dick. Uh. To, total nuts for Pat, you know what I mean? Um, I, I don't know, he was probably about 14, 15 when he started going to games and um, then just home and away, just going away where everyone had a great time, uh, lived for Pat's, uh, very intelligent guy, um, 
not the most athletic, but <laughs> you know, he he was the brains of the operation sort of thing, you know. Yeah. But um, good crack, and you know, always gone away with Pat's fans, and they had a great, great small, well, not so small, but a, a great close knit kind of band of fans down there that kind of went home and away and we all went to each other's parties and 24s and whatever and they had a great time so look it's just one of those things I'm sure a lot of people have gone through it and it's just unfortunate bad enough for me being his brother but I, I, you obviously have kids yourself yeah. if you know when I have kids now I can feel it for me man and dad like Jesus Christ if I lost my kid or you lost your kid you just never get over it just one of, the, one of those things you never get over um, time's a great healer but easier for easier for his brothers to get over it than obviously me man and dad will kind of never get over it you know it's just, just one of those things yeah I always say to people a parent should never bury a child yeah that's the way it is yeah uh, you know um, let's bring it back up again I have a few questions here that were sent in I told you at the start of the show these will be some interesting ones um, the best player you ever played with and against? Um, I'd probably have to break it down into two, really, then, because obviously when I was at Leeds, Cantona was there, so he was kind of the kind of the best I ever saw. Him, kind of uh, Dave Batty and Gary Spade, brilliant players, like sort of thing. Um, League of Ireland probably would be uh, Liam Coyle at Derry City. You know, you just you um, you playing on one leg and um, you're still probably the best player in the league. Um, kind of couldn't run, but <laughs> he used to just turn defenders inside out. I don't know what it was. He, it looked like he was moving in slow motion, but they always seemed to end up on their arse. So um, probably break it up into them two categories, sort of thing. You know. Mm. And in terms of playing against you, probably who were those guys when you were going out as a keeper? Going, this guy always gets one on me or something like that. Yeah, do you know who it was? Uh, it was Eddie Gormley. Always seemed to fucking score on me. Always seemed to score on me for some reason. Now I know he's probably scoring a lot of people, but um, like I you know, kind of around our area, and I wouldn't take anything away from a lot of people. You know, would rave on about Kevin Hunt. But I used to love playing against Kevin Hunt because Kevin Hunt, you knew what he was doing all the time. He'd never play a true ball and he'd play it side to side, never have a shot. Eddie Gormley was the complete opposite. He had everything. He could shoot from 40 yards, right foot, left foot. You can spray a ball, true balls, strong, aggressive, keep the ball. He, like he had everything, you know, and he used to whip in a fucking great corner and down a pats, down a shed end. It was a nightmare. It was nearly the crowd. You nearly bleed and drew it in with their breath. And you've got fucking Johnny McDonald and you've got fucking Ozo coming in. And you got fucking other players there. Ricky O'Flaherty, he just put it up there under the fucking crossbar. <laughs> you've got them lads known coming in mm-hmm. and probably a hell of win coming down to the bleeding shed end as well. Yeah, so it'd be definitely probably Eddie Gormley. Yeah, probably buckets of rain as well back then. Ah, oh, yeah, jeez, <laughs> yeah. The Middle winter. of winter. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh. And a quagmire of a pitch. Absolutely. We finish out on one, which is which is always a good one, and this is one that most people have to think about. If you could have dinner with anyone, past or present, alive or dead, who would you have dinner with? Um, it doesn't have to be football either now. I'd football. say uh, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. Interesting. Go on. Yeah, no, just have a have a great interest in kind of Roman times and um just the way he did things, the risks, the risks he took at certain things, like he was totally broke, totally bankrupt, up to his eyes and fucking death. Didn't bother, pressed on, bothering more, and then just you know, was he believed in himself and his own fortitude and came true and you know, he, he like he didn't. You know, nowadays he'd be a, a despot, but like he'd kill. You know, he, at certain times, and he'd kill a hundred thousand civilians, and not think about it. You know what I mean? Just amazing, and you'd kind of to to get into that uh, that mindset and just talk to him and just see the way he thinks. So imagine how guarded you'd be during that meal because you could end up on the end of one of those spears. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be too... He was actually very merciful. 
Do you know what I mean? Like he was portrayed by Brutus even before he was killed by him, mm. but he forgave him. And he uh, a lot of people that you know tried to kill him and assassinate him, he uh, forgave even before he was assassinated again. So he was a uh, merciful when he wanted to be, but an, an absolute tyrant when he didn't want to be. You know. Mm. Great answer. That's a great. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that now at all. Brilliant answer. Um, well, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks a million for taking it. Uh, no problem. Really enjoyed it. I, I love these stories and these throwbacks. I love going back through time and this stuff. It's, it, it reminds me of such a nostalgia effect. At times when you were telling these stories, the hair stands up on my arm thinking about those those moves and nights and football and stories. And everything else and yeah, that. like it was a different time. Like, you know, you'd, you know, as you, you could you'd be buying your cans on the way down to matches and yeah. like totally like today these days like it's it's totally professional but uh probably more characters back in them days you know yeah, okay. get away with more no uh no phones <laughs> I, I, i'd often say a much better time much better. yeah yeah but it's it'd be, you know I, I wouldn't fancy being a kid now you know you you can't get pissed around because someone's fucking video and you're making a fool of yourself yeah. where yeah. You know, you could do anything you want back in the day, and all you'd, you'd wake up and kind of have the the tremors, or they kind of go, "Geez, what happened last night?" But there was no video evidence of it, so it was forgotten that later that day. You know, no VAR. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, a pleasure having you on. This has been the Upper Tier Podcast Legend Series with Tommy O'Dell. Head over to YouTube, join them on Podcast Network. If you have any questions or comments ready, you can drop them into the episode. If you want to contact us, we're on Facebook and Instagram, The Upper Tier. You'll also get us on Twitter at the underscore upper underscore tier. Tony, absolute pleasure. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Noel. Cheers, bud. Look after yourself, mate.